Hi class, uh, welcome back to our poetry course. And I hope you really enjoyed our discussion with Joe Kane. And next week, I'm very excited for to see how our discussion with Jay Sheets goes. Um, yeah, I, I decided to bring you outside today, right? Welcome, this is my home. I, at least this is my patio. Um, I'm a big gardener and which I'm sure some of you could imagine. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to sort of switch it up a little bit. And I've been thinking a lot about how um, maybe right now we're not as like, you know, sort of like personal. Um, and so it kind of lacks in that sense of like the, the intimacy of the classroom. But in a way, you know, you are kind of getting to be, you're getting to see, um, yourselves in a little bit more of a comfortable uh, discussion forum. I've been really impressed with um, some of the posts that you've been doing online. Um, and yeah, you're also kind of getting to to see me be more in a relaxed setting. So maybe that's also going to influence the way that I can freely talk about poetry, you know. Um, I hope you're all still staying healthy and uh, making good choices, and so yeah, my hair is looking exceptionally like Earth, Earth woman today. I don't know why, but anyway, we're going to talk today about symbolism, allegory, and then we're going to touch on irony, right? Um, but we probably won't be able to spend as much time on irony. So when we start looking at symbolism, symbolism, again, it's sort of one of those like very complicated terms for something that we're actually very familiar with. Uh, symbolism in literature is used to give a concrete understanding to something that is abstract, right? Because again, that's that's really what I think one of the most major goals in poetry would be is to, to find a way to give um, a concrete understanding to an abstract sensation or understanding, right? Because we're so limited in how we, we're so limited by language and also in a way freed by becoming aware of our limitations, right? So a symbol is the use of a concrete object to rap represent an abstract idea. The term symbol when used in literature is often a figure of speech in which a person, object, or situation represents something in addition to its literal meaning. Uh, conventional or traditional literary symbols work in much the same way, and because they are previously agreed upon meaning, they can be used to suggest ideas more universal than the physical aspects themselves. So what that means is um, we have conventional symbols, and we're going to look at a little uh, conventional symbols in a little bit. But again, right, we're always trying to sort of reimagine language, and we're trying to reimagine how we present and we understand language. So when we're looking or we're working in our own poetry, something that you might want to consider is, um, can I reinvent this sort of... Um, very conventional symbol in a way that it evo evokes that like feeling of familiarity, but then it also reawakens us to that association that we already have. Um, and again, we're actually really good at representing or recognizing symbols. We just aren't as aware of it as we would think we should be. Yeah, right. That's kind of a confusing way of saying something simple, but I'm good at that. Um, so, for example, we're looking at this image of the rose, right? And what do roses symbolically represent? Love. Let's look at another one, right? This is the scale. A woman blinded and holding a scale. What does this symbolically represent? Justice, right? She's blind because supposedly we want our justice to be blind, right? Um, and then she's always looking to, to find the correct balance between the two, right? Um, and then lastly, if we look at this, what does this symbolically represent? And no, it's not St. Patrick's Day and green beer, right? Gross. It's instead it's luck, right? Um, 
And so again, we're we're very good at reading symbols. We just haven't really um, recognized maybe, we might not be as aware of how good at reading symbols we are. So from our, our, our literary theory reading, our poet, poetic theory reading that we did this week, we have this really interesting poem that Rich is, is considering that's sort of embedded in the, in the essay itself. It reads, Galatius, like something from the planet Krypton, which like something from the planet Krypton, we know already that we're dealing with a simile, right? In the suave, brilliant wattage of the bomb, we were not poor. In the atoms fizz and pop, we heard possibility uncorked. Taffeta wraps whispered on Davenports, right? So what is in this passage the bomb coming to symbolize, right? What, does the, what is the usage of the bomb and what is it coming to represent? What is it coming to symbolize? Sorry, sometimes I have to like move myself around. Sorry. Okay, so in the suave, brilliant wattage of the bomb, we were not poor. This you could say is the political core of the poem, the meaning without which it could not exist. Right, and I like that she puts meaning in quotation marks there, right? Because we've been talking a lot this semester about, you know, what is, what is the poem doing? Because not all poems have literal meaning. Um, or narrative, right? So the meaning without which it could not exist. All that the bomb was meant to mean, a spectacle of power, promising limitless possibilities to the powerless, all the falseness of its promise, the power, the original devastation of two cities, the ongoing fallout into local communities, reservations, all the way to the Pacific Islands. This is the driving impulse of the palm, the energy it rides. Yet all this would be mere, would be mere message and forgettable without the palm's visual fury, its extraordinary leaps of sound and image. Ellie lay dull and scuffed, a miner's boot toe worn away and dim. Taffeta wraps whispered on Davenport's. The planet Krypton is Superman's planet, falling apart. The bits of rubble, its flings to Earth, dangerous to the hero. Earth has not become, has now become its own autotoxic planet Krypton. Right. So what she's talking about here is the usage of the bomb to symbolize. Uh, maybe man's ultimate destruction of themselves, right? Our autotoxicity, our impact on uh, our global environment, but it also could be too, we can read it as sort of uh, um, a uh, uh, um, um, from a Marxist perspective, right? And that what she's doing is she's finding a way to, to, um, to destabilize the, 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 the very finite division between the rich and the poor, right? Because in the presence of the bomb, in the wake of the explosion, in the might of all power, it doesn't matter who you are or what you are. We're all equal in the eyes of this sort of unearthing, unrecognizable power, awe-inspiring um, so now let me move myself over again. Do, 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 do. Yay, I'm over here now. Um, I'm going to come down here because I really like this gift. It's one of my favorites. Um, symbols in literature. Writers use symbols to suggest layers of meaning that a simple literal statement could never convey. To speak more powerfully to the reader's emotions and imaginations to enrich the meaning or presentation of the works, right? So again, like that's what the power of a symbol is, is that it's able to give this sort of like powerful, um, uh, multi-layered uh, presentation 
that, you know, what do we want to do with poetry? We want to force a pause. We want to force our reader to have to meditate, to think on what it is that we're doing so that they can experience that emotion through their own sort of sense of meditation, right? Um, and what the symbol does, right? What these really rich symbols do is they, they wake us up, they shake us up out of our complacency so that we're not, you know, again, just sort of consuming concepts. Instead, we're, 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 we're reimagining them as readers of poetry, as, um, I don't know. But yeah, readers of poetry, I think that would be the best way to say what I'm trying to say. Um, and so we're going to look at color and color as having a very sort of fixed symbolic meaning. Um, we'll start with red, right? Red is a moral, pa blood, passion, emotion danger or daring, often associated with fire, right? So red can be uh, damning, red can be uh, commonplace, red can be, uh, not commonplace, red is never commonplace. Red can be jarring, red can be also redemptive, right? Um, washed in the blood is a very common, meta, uh, like a common phrase that we, we in America are familiar with, right? So that, that sense of red. If we think back to when we were lecturing on, um, oh, what was I lecturing on? A uh, writing to the senses, right? The, the concept of synesthesia in our writing, right? The bright red noise, that it's always sort of this, there is a sense of warning or of danger or of definitely attention seeking that we get from the color red. Um, green, green is an experience or naivete, right? Or youth, um, hope, new life. And I would say new life, not necessarily as being childlike, right? Green, if we look at also what seasons have a tendency to represent, it's more um, untarnished life would be a way of looking at it, right? It's a life that isn't as familiar with the pain associated with life. Uh, immaturity, it is a comforting, refreshing human color. It is part of the color of plant life. And that's true. Like, like look, look around just at all the green, right? We are constantly, there's not as much green in my yard because I had to replant my grass, right? but we're constantly sort of surrounded by this color and this color is familiar. This color is human-like, this color is natural, right? And so it has this very comforting sort of recognition to it when it's in a setting that it should be in. Um, there's a beautiful frost poem, right? Nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold, um, her early, leaves of flower, but only so an hour. So, oh, I can never remember that line, right? So Eden sank to grief. When dawn goes down today, nothing gold can stay, which is this sort of meditative poem that Frost is writing. And what he's, what he's, what he's looking at, what he's considering is the, the short lived, untarnished, unbroken uh, existence that we all have, right? Um, and so through this like acknowledgement that green is so, so fleeting and yet it's when we are at our core, our richest, our most nourished, our most uh, vigorous even, right? That's what green can do. No nature's first green is gold, right? Nature's first green is cherished. Yellow, yellow is an interesting color in that we have a lot of different um, sorts of relations to yellow, right? Um, that it's both joyous, happy, 
um, effervescent, I think would be a cool color word to use for yellow, but then it's also sanguine and tarnished and decay, right? Um, think about liver failure and when we become jaundiced, that our eyes are yellowed, our skin becomes yellowed. And so it's this sort of sense of sickliness, um, violence, dec decrepitude, old age, um, and then the approach of death. It's also bright happiness, right? The sun is yellow and we also yellow as we begin to decay. I don't know. Um, so yellow is an interesting symbol for us color wise, right? And that it's, it's not as easy to pin down, but it's definitely has a presence when we use color in our writing, right? Um, because again, it's something that we can all relate to very e easily, right? That, that color has something that is both a visual and an emotional truth or an emotional reaction. Oh no, I gotta move myself again. Come here, Robin, you're in the way. There we go. Uh, blue is cool, calm, peaceful, and in um, insubstantial, insubstantial color in the real world, except as trans translucency, the void of heavens. Right. So the sky is blue. We're again. We're we're the sky's not as blue today. So I'm not going to show it to you. It's a little bit overcast. Oh, I pray that it's not going to rain again. I can't, I can't handle another rainy day. Um, but uh, we're, we're always sort of inundated with blue. Water is always sort of accounted as blue. Um, sky is blue. And so there is this sort of like peaceful, ethereal, almost like meditative. Ooh, almost knocked my computer over. Um quality to the color itself. <sighs> um, that we're, we're, we're relatively, we're relatively familiar with, right? Um, calming, peaceful, though I think is definitely something that we can take away from this familiar. We'll look at blue here in a little bit. Pink, innocent femininity, right? So if we think back to the roses that we had, we didn't have red roses, and so color also carries sorts of um, it can it, it can enrich a symbol more. Where a red rose is passionate love, right? It's a it's it's deep, passionate, uh, emotional, physical love in a sense. White is eternal love, right? Um, it's a love that's long lasting. Pink is flirtatious love, new love, young love, innocent love, right? So the pink rose is a flirtatious rose. It's not um, a heated symbol. Instead, it's a playful symbol. Purple, royalty, also bruising and pain. Um, purple is an interesting color in that uh, a lot for a while, a lot of, uh, it was associated as a very feminine color, which is not traditionally what purple represents. Purple actually used to represent like royalty, um, and also sort of strength, right? Because to be royal was to, to embody a sort of sense of strength. Um, and now it, some, some, I think that this is changing a lot. I think that color is becoming something that's more fluid again, right? Where we're seeing more young men wearing pink and um, and purple, right? But we we for a while associated that color very much as like a feminine color, when in reality, traditionally it wasn't, right? Purple dye was expensive. And so only people who had uh, who who had wealth were able to to possess clothes that were colored purple. So fun facts, right? Fun facts from your English professor. Yes. Um, we transition into brown. Brown is the color of dirt of the earth, right? Uh, we succumb to brown. Uh, there's always, I mean, especially in American literature, that like 
connection between um, America and the land, right? So the land, the earth is brown, it is dark, the soil. Uh, it can also represent poverty, right? Um, it can also represent, you know, something that is vile. Uh, brown is an interesting emotional color. Something that I got into with my last semester's poetry class that was really interesting was that um, a lot of them talked about how uh, these colors are, these the symbolic meaning of these colors is actually a cultural. Um, and so that these the, the use of these colors might mean something different throughout different culture, right? Um, and so that's something to consider too, again, as a way of sort of reinvigorating a very classic symbol is to use it for, for a, to use it from the sense of familiarity, but to reawaken it from a different cultural perspective, I think could be a really powerful tool that we could use in our own poetry. And then violet is the com is composed of red and blue. It is the color of temperance, clarity of mind, right? Because red is heated, red is volatile, red is compassionate, red is uh, uh, ev evocative. That's a great word for it, right? And then blue is calm and tranquil, tranqu tranquil, peaceful, right? Um, and so the the use of the two, it is that balance. It's the it's the balance that we seek right? And then lastly, white. And white is innocence, life, light, purity, or enlightenment, right? That we know that that light, that white is often used as the sort of um, holy, holy presence, consuming holy presence, we could argue. We look at seasonal change, right? Seasons have symbolic meaning. Um, spring is birth, new life, regeneration, uh, new beginning. Summer is maturity or knowledge. Uh, it's, it's the point of life in which we're at our peak, right? Where we're not, we're not completely We're not jaded yet, but we're not trusting as we once were, right? Again, that, that green is gold sort of sensation. Sorry, my hair. It's like weird having to always be on a screen um, and aware of what my crazy head of hair can do. Um, autumn is the decline, right? It's the, the, the approach towards the end. Um, we're going to read. <coughs> oh, I can't remember if we read it this week or not. But we're going to read um, Gwendolyn Brooks' Sunset of the City. And it's a beautiful poem in which she's thinking about, she's, like, she's writing about the aging process. Uh, of, a, of a woman as she begins to to enter into old age and there's this really beautiful passage or this description that she uses and it's I am summer gone so she won't acknowledge that that's autumn right that's the beginning that's the the, the walk towards the end she is not autumn she is she is summer gone which is this sort of really interesting, almost, um, what's a good word? What am I trying to look for? Disassociative way of, of looking at oneself as, you know, beginning to enter into this new stage. Um, winter is death, sleep, hibernation, stagnation. Right. There's a there's a sort of sense of deadening, I think, just in winter. Something that I, I really like to do is um, 
when we get a snow, I and snow is still so m magical for me. Uh, Nashville is the coldest place I've ever lived. I used to live in um, southern Georgia, right? So I remember the first time I saw snow, and it is this like sort of blanketing, blanketed quiet that envelops us. So I always like to, the first time that it snows, I, I like to walk, go for a walk by myself at night, which you're probably not supposed to do. So I sh should probably not tell you, I don't know. Uh, I like to go for a walk at night around Radnor Lake in the snow and just feel the stillness, right? It's been something that I've been doing too during the quarantine is I'll go for a walk at night um, just to observe the stillness that's, that's happening around us. It's an interesting thing, right? Because we're not familiar with that. Oh, Christmas is birth, change, or for the, for the better. Easter is rebirth and enlightenment. Light is truth, darkness is evil, right? Um, and yeah, take my modern, my early American Lit class if you want to really see where the darkness first sort of come becomes very sort of um, a very sort of weighted, heavy symbol for the early colonists. It's interesting how how much that that contrast plays into American literature and American poetry that. A dark and light. So I want to look at this poem by E.E. E. Cummings. Um, and yes, this is a poem. <laughs> that was something really funny that my my one of my poetry students asked me last semester. Like, he was famous for writing this poem. Yeah. Um, E. e. Cummings is a visual artist, which I think is important to, to consider when we when we approach this poem itself, because the way that it, it's presented on the page is almost more than the reading of the poem or than the words themselves represent, right? Um, e. e. Cummings is aware of the, the, the sort of flaw in his medium, and so he's trying to figure out ways of overcoming this flaw. My neighbor's children are outside playing, and it's, it's nice to watch. Um, so E.E. E. Cummings. A leaf falls. Loneliness. And so what he's doing is he's looking, he's trying, he's, he's imagining the most isolated symbol that he can, and he's trying to recreate that sense of, isolation and loneliness and loss. And so it's the image of a single leaf. A leaf falls, one, loneliness, right? And there is, like that, that's the first leaf. There's a sense of, <coughs> yeah. a sense of bravery to be the first one to dare to fall. <clears throat> so you go it alone. Um, right? We'll talk about this in a minute, right? Cowardice or courage. We are the ones that find our way back. So you can be the first to fall. And so you fall in isolation. You fall in without a sense of camaraderie. Or a leaf falls when you're the, the last to fall. And I think it's a powerful tool in poetry if we, we learn to think of ways to, to connect to the language that 
reawakens our, our emotional connection to the literature, right? To fall alone, to fall in isolation. So symbolism versus allegory. We're going to read an allegory together today. Um, one that I think that a lot of you have heard me lecture on. But a symbol is a word, place, character, or object that means something beyond what it is on the literal level. An allegory involves using many interconnected symbols or allegorical figures in such a uh, such as a way that is nearly every element of the narrative has a meaning beyond the literal level. Uh, but something that's that's interesting with allegory, right, is that there is there is always this connection that we can make to the first for, to the to the to the first level to the surface level of the work. Um, everything in the narrative is a symbol that relates to other symbols within the story. Allegory, um, there's a story in which characters, setting, and action stand for something beyond themselves, such as abstract ideas, moral qualities, historical figures, or events, um, and can be read on two levels. There's the literal and the symbolic, right? There's the surface level, and then there's the deeper level, um, and are often intended to teach a moral lesson or to make a comment about goodness and vice. So we're pretty familiar with reading allegory. Um, again, we just might not understand that it is allegory. An allegory is a story. Eh, skip that. So further practice. Uh, I've included a picture here of a snake. Uh, maybe I'll go right here. That might be where. I'll go up here. There we go. So I've included the picture of a serpent and an apple. Right. And so what do these these two symbols represent? What are some things that come to mind when you see this image? <clears throat> the, the snake is used to symbolize temptation or trouble. This allegory stems from a biblical reference. Right. So the, this the serpent represents temptation. Right. That he comes to Eve in the garden. Um, and so then we can arrive at the understanding that knowledge of good and evil or temptation or any indulgence or pleasure that is considered illegal or moral, which we can all arrive at an understanding just viewing this, the, the interplay of these three symbols really at work, right? The woman's hand, the apple, and the snake. Let's look together more now at Adrian Rich's Somebody Somewhere is Writing a Poem. Oh no, I'm gonna have to find where I belong on all of these. Make myself small. I prefer being small anyway. Right, so uh, what poetry is made of is so old, so familiar, that it is easy to forget that it is not just the words but the polyrhythmic sounds, speech in its first endeavors. Every poem breaks a silence that had to be overcome. Prismatic meaning lit by each other's, by each other's light, stained by each other's shadows. In the wash of poetry, the old, beaten, worn stones of language take on colors that disappear when you see sieve them up out of the stream bed and try to sort them out. So again, with poetry, what we're doing is we're evoking a sensation that is familiar, that is, that is uh, maybe perhaps relatable to, to, to all part of the human experience, right? So it's familiar to all of us, but if it becomes too familiar, if it becomes too overwrought, it becomes cliche. So it's this sort of playful dance that we have to have between sound and symbol and presentation and meaning and familiarity, but also exotic, right? Because there's no 
point in having read something over and over again that is commonplace. In the wash of poetry, the old beaten, worn stones of language take on colors that disappear when you sieve them up out of the stream bed and try to sort them out. Oh, it's so beautiful. Like that, that line is such a perfect way of, of imagining what it is that poetry does is it reawakens us to the meaning, the literal meaning, the individual meaning of language or to a single word. And it also can, can uh, reinvent the ways in which we associate to that word or to that phrase. So it takes the old, the beaten, the worn out, the overused, the, um, the, the cliché, the dull understanding of language and it disappears because we bring out this new color, this new life into the words that are on the page. We reawaken it. We make it evocative, right? I can't write a poem to manipulate you. It will not succeed. Perhaps you have read such poems and decided you don't care for poetry. Something turned you away. I can't write a poem from dishonest motives. It will betray its shoddy provenance and will make ill made, it, like an ill-made tool, a scissor, a drill. It will not serve its purpose. It will become a part of your hands at the point of stress. I can't write a poem simply from good intentions, wanting to see things right, to make it all better. The energy will leak out of it, and it will end up being me end up by meaningless, by meaningless, more meaningless. It will end by meaningless less than it says. Hmm. I think that might be a typo, but it might not be. I can't write a poem simply from good intentions, wanting to set things right, make it better, and the energy will leak out of it. Oh, I can't. It will end by meaning less than it says. What she's getting at here is I can't write a poem that's so far outside of truth or reality. I can't write a poem of great grandeur. I can't write a poem that's not honest and true because it won't live. It won't move beyond the page because there is no authenticity to it. That again, it's that we're always being grounded in the human experience. And so it's that, that grounding that brings us a sort of sense of renewal, exploration. Someone writing a poem believes in a reader, in the readers of that poem. The who of that reader quivers like a jellyfish. Self-reference is always possible that my I is a universal we, that the reader is my clone, that sending letters to myself is enough for attention to be paid, that my chip of mirror contains the world. You go back to that that we were talking about in the earlier slide, right? That that the that I can't write a poem that is outside of my own wheelhouse. I can't write a poem that's, that's not authentic and that isn't, in a sense, real for me, a truth to my own. And so I'm sending out these, these poems hoping that, or with the belief that, that the I is, that what I have experienced is one that is and transcend to, 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 to the we, to the multiple. 
But most often someone writing a poem believes in, depends on a delicate vibrating range of difference that an I can become a we without extinguishing others, that a partly common language exists in which strangers can be their own heartbeat, memory, images a language that itself has learned from the heartbeat, memories, images of strangers. A language that itself has learned from the heartbeat, memories, images of strangers. Yeah, it's the universal language. It's the universal experience. Uh, again, the, the collective unconsciousness in a sense, right? That I write a poem that nurtures the eye and I send it out into the world and I hope that it nurtures the we. Someone is writing a poem. Words are being set down in a force field. It's as if the words themselves have magnetic charges. They veer together, or in polarity, they swerve against each other. Part of the force field, the charge, is the working history of the words themselves, how someone has known them, used them, doubted and relied on them in a life. Part of the movement among the words belongs to sound, the guttural, the liquid, the choppy, the drawn, out of the breathy, the visceral, and the down light. Down I think that that's what that says. The down light. Someone is writing a poem. So we're going to come to our uh, in-class writing exercise. Uh, and remember, you put this down in your journal, and it will not count as the three poems that you are required to write um, every week, but it will count as uh, it will count towards your final grade. Amid all this chaos, as we retreat into our small portions of the universe, we are seeing the world change around us. What do you want to return and what do you want to be destroyed? Why, write a brief thought experiment where you consider how and if society will evolve after this time of social distancing. And so part of what you're going to have to do, right, because you're imagining a new reality, is you're also going to have to um, find a way to use familiar symbols that help us understand or relate to the thought experiment that's being conducted, right? So again, no form, don't get caught up in form. Instead, I just want you to take a couple minutes and write a poem or a thought experiment on the above prompt, the prompt on the screen. I'm gonna set my famous timer. And so just write, right? Write until you think you've come to the end.
I hope you guys can hear the birds as you're riding. Couple more minutes. All right, so we're all done, right? Finish up your last couple of thoughts. Um, and we're going to move on to reading our first or looking at an allegory together. This is, I would definitely argue, an allegorical poem. It's Diving into the Wreck by Adrian Rich. Okay. Where's my cursor? Because I feel like I should go like right here during this one. And I could be made larger again. Right? There we go. Don't you feel comforted knowing that I'm right here? <laughs> um, uh, so first, having read the Book of Myths and loaded the camera and checked the edge of a knife blade... I put on the body armor of black rubber, the absurd flippers, the grave and awkward mask. So here, Adrian Rich is using the the um, the metaphor, using a diving metaphor, right? To there's the story, there's the surface understanding of the poem as as a dive, right? But then she's using that to bring us to sort of a deeper understanding. Um, we begin with first having read the Book of Myths. And so that's something that I've talked about in a lot of my classes. Like, what is the Book of Myths? And for me, the Book of Myths is anything, right? Uh, I read this poem a lot as sort of a critique of the way that we recount history of the way that we um, have a tendency to want to mythologize the past or really, in a sense, to mythologize anything that um, we, we choose to record. We don't record the mundane, the simple moments. Instead, we record the, the, the task, the difficult moments. 
Um, and so having read the book of myths could be anything, right? Um, but I think too, in this poem, it'd be a book about diving, you know, it's preparedness. A lot of this poem is uh, learning versus experience, right? Until we witness it for ourselves, we never really understand the truth of it. And so we have to go, we have to venture on this journey to experience it for ourselves. First, having read the Book of Myths and loaded the camera, right? We, we're bringing a camera, which is also something that is common diving equipment, right? She's very good at not really losing that above metaphor until we get to the end when there's obviously something strange happening that we are supposed to understand that there's then a transformation taken place, right? So we would bring the camera because we want to, to remember it. We want to record it, right? Um, and two, we want to bring the camera because we sort of have this belief that images can be more true than words, right? Than people's telling of them. And so we bring the camera to have better proof, better proof of the journey itself and check the edge of a knife, the knife blade. Again, a knife is common uh, diving equipment for those of you who ever do, do dive, right? Um, but it's also, again, it creates that sense of teetering, right? There's this sort of uh, walking a thin line that's created by the, by the invasion of the knife blade. And also it evokes a sense of danger, right? Uh, I put on the body armor of black rubber, the absurd flippers, the grave and awkward mask. When I read that, I think a lot about sort of the strange transformation I've had to go through in my like education, right? Um, I, can't, I, can't, I, I previously lived in a very small rural town in Georgia and as I've gone through this journey to to have a deep to have a deeper understanding, or as I've become more and more learned, or more and more um, studied, that that education in a way separates me from that community that I was once a part of. Right? Um, you step out of ignorance and it becomes very difficult to, to look back and to, to be a part of the community before. So there is this sort of the preparedness that we're undergoing. In a strange sense, it does create or isolate me from a community I once used to belong to. And right now where I am, it, it doesn't make sense, right? It's unnatural, it's not um, it doesn't fit the setting that I'm in because I'm still on the surface. I'm still on the boat. I haven't, I haven't embarked yet. I'm having to do this, not like Cousteau with his assiduous team aboard the stun flooded schooner, but here alone. And isolation is a big part of this poem, right? When we venture to a point and we are, we, we, we know that we have to go on this journey by ourselves. We can't bring anyone with us. And so Rich very interestingly and masterfully, right? Sorry, I'm trying to get comfortable. <laughs> um, Rich, Rich very masterfully is preparing us to embrace that sense of isolation almost as we, as we begin the poem. And Cousteau is a famous diver from the 80s, right, who's sort of famous for these carpe diem phrases, you know. Um, and so she's, she's using that to juxtapose our experience, what we, what the I, what the speaker is having to do versus maybe what we're more familiar with with diving. It's also against the rules to dive alone. So just FYI, for any of you who do become divers later in life, no, you're not supposed to dive alone. There is a ladder. 
and the ladder is always there. Notice that there is a ladder is a complete thought, right? We begin the poem, there is a ladder. And the ladder is always there, hanging innocently close to the side of the schooner. We know what it is for, we who have used it. Otherwise, it's a piece of maritime floss, some sundry equipment. So there is a ladder. And the ladder is so significant, it gets its own complete thought and it begins the stanza. And the ladder is this very interesting sort of symbol because it's proof of the book of myths in a way because the ladder is not mentioned. If we think about when we read a book about diving, people don't tell you how to, they tell you how to descend and how to ascend, but they don't tell you about the ladder. When in reality, the ladder is what, separ is what, is what connects us between two worlds. We have the above and the below. We have the air and we have the sea, we have life. And in a sense, we have death, right? Safety and danger. And the ladder is what did, is what brings us to each point. The ladder is our salvation. The ladder is our dissension. But we never talk about the ladder. We never talk about the venturing forth, the departure. There is a ladder. The ladder is always there. Hanging innocently close to the side of the schooner. We know what it is for, we who have used it. So until you've gone on this journey, until you've gone on this dive, until you've begun this venture, you will never understand the significance of it. Because you can't, because you haven't needed the ladder yet. And so once, once you, we know what it is for, we who have used it, we who have gone out, we, there, there is, in, in a sense, Rich is laying out that there's two types of people in this world, that there's those who have used the ladder and then there's those who have not used the ladder yet, right? We know what it is for. We who have used it. And for everyone else, it is just a piece of maritime floss. It's just superfluous. It's just something that's on a boat, right? And I think back, I spent a long time in Alaska. Um, not a long time, but I lived up in Alaska during salmon season one year. Um, and I actually lived on a dock. Uh, while I was working at a salmon cannery. And at night, I used to go and I would sit at the end of the dock on this pillar that was all by itself. And I would just, I would watch the shipyard and I'd watch the ocean just to take a break, just to pause. And I think back on it and I always think of it when I teach this poem, I never noticed the ladder. It was just a part of a boat, something that I would never mention, right? Um, and so until you've, you've recognized the significance, until you've gone on the journey itself, you don't know the power that the beginning or the path to to the beginning or the pathway from, from the, the wreck to safety is because you've never had to use it. And it's not, it's not written in the book of myths. We don't ever think to give to give the ladder power or presence because we think of it as insignificant. Sundry equipment too. There's a recording of Rich reading this this online, uh, and I really love the way that she reads this poem because she, for some reason reads it with this very strange sort of like southern twang whenever she gets to summer is sundry it's some sundry equipment right i go down again 
complete thought first line, right? That's a sentence. It's not in jam. It's an end stop line, right? So I go down. Rung after rung, and still the oxygen immerses me. The blue light, the clear atoms of our human air. We're still familiar. We haven't departed yet. We're beginning to, right? We've, we've begun the ladder. We've begun the descent. But we're still immersed in what we know. We haven't departed from anything yet. I go down. My flippers cripple me. I crawl like an insect down the ladder. And there is no one to tell me when the ocean will begin. And it's, it's happening. That's why she uses repetition too, right? I go down, I go down in this stanza uh, because she's calling attention to the, to the descent, to the beginning. I crawl like an insect. Again, we're prepared for a place that we are not at right now, um, that our preparedness is making us foreign and unfamiliar. Uh, we're in a, you know, detached from our setting and no one's prepared us for how weird that's going to feel, right? Because the latter is not mentioned in the book of myths. And then in a way that makes you question how many things are not mentioned in the book of myths. What else do they leave out, right? So there is this real sort of sense of fear and, um, and questioning that's happening. I'm going to go inside right now because my computer might die. So I'll be right back. All right, now I'm back inside. Uh, right, so so the latter is often left out of the of the book of myths, right? We, we never know when that venture is going to begin. We never know what it's going to look like. We never know how it's going to, how it's going to conclude. But as we descend, right? that sort of sense of anxiety is building up in us because this is not familiar. I am foreign. I am, I'm ill prepared for what I'm about to, to, to begin. All right. First the air is blue and then it is bluer and then it is green. First the air is blue and then it is bluer, and then it is green. First it is familiar, first it is tranquil, first it is peaceful, then it becomes heightened, it becomes more intense, but yet, oh no. Sorry, I wasn't ready to move, right? Uh, then it becomes more intense, and in that intensifying, it becomes foreign, it becomes unfamiliar, and then it becomes green. And green is new, right? We know that green is young, new, symbolic, uh, coming of age, naivety, right? But it's also foreign and strange um, and new, and we're not comfortable with it yet. And then it is black. I am blacking out and yet my mask is powerful. It pumps my blood with power. The sea is another story. The sea is not a question of power. I have to learn alone to turn my body without force in the deep element. Right? First it is blue and then it is green and then it is black. becomes dangerous feeling. It becomes uh, disheartening. It becomes hard to see direction through, right? And now it is easy to forget what I came here for among so many who have always lived here swaying there, crenellated fans between the wreaths. And besides, you breathe differently down here.
and now it is easy to forget what I came here for. Uh, notice that this is the first time we're no longer isolated. And I think that that's an important uh, moment to recognize in this poem because it's one of the ways that we stop people from, from going on this journey is we, or from being sort of um, non-conforming and venturing out past the point of standardization. As we tell you, if you go, you go at it alone and you begin your journey alone. But here we find that for the first time, we're not alone. We were just told we would always be alone. And now it is easy to forget what I came here for. Uh, we go back to the previous stanza. First it is green and then it is black. I am blacking out and yet my mask is powerful. It pumps my blood with power. The sea is another story. The sea is not a question of power. Interesting, right? Because we would like to, when we think about the sea, we sort of, we think about it as this like all powerful, all mighty force, right? That what is man in comparison to the ocean? A nothing, right? But this power, or maybe our construction or understanding of power is what is wrong. Because the sea is another story. The sea is not a question of power. We've always kind of been taught to fight, to rage, to, to, to rebel even. And here, the sea is not a question of power. It's me that brought that, because my, uh, my mask is powerful, it pumps my blood with power, but the sea is another story. The sea is not a question of power. I have to learn alone. Because I have been taught wrong. Again, what is being left out of the book of myths? What is being colored in the book of myths to deter us from wanting to begin? I have to learn alone to turn my body without force in the deep element. You know, and part of, partly why I love this poem so much is because I love the her beautiful connection that she still has to the diving metaphor, right? Um, that if you've ever been fully submerged in the deep ocean, right? When you turn your body, you have to learn how to turn with the water, right? That you can't fight against the water as furiously as you, you would think that it is this sort of like dance almost or a really different sort of movement, but I also have to learn to turn alone, to turn my body without force in the deep element. I have to learn how not to fight because to fight, to rebel is to acknowledge power. But here there is, the sea is another story. The sea is not a question of power. And so that makes this next stanza so, so impactful, right? Because, and now it is easy to forget what I came here for among so many who have always lived here, swaying their crenellated fans between the reefs. And besides, you breathe differently down here. So now once I've stopped fighting, once I've stopped uh, participating 
in the power dynamic that I would have to participate in to feed, I realize how many allies or how I never was actually isolated. It was just that sense of being strange that was used to isolate me. Among so many who have always lived here, swaying their crenellated fans, and crenellated is such a great word, right? Again, we go back to word choice. The difference between the right word and the wrong word is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. Swaying their crenellated fans means folded. You know, like the, like children make paper fans. That's what crenellated is. It's folded. It's also like the wreaths, right? Swaying their crenellated fans. And besides, you breathe differently down here. You are, if the breath is different, then is not everything different? I came to explore the wreck. The words are purposes. The words are maps. I came to see the damage that was done and the treasures that prevail. I stroke the beam of my lamp slowly along the flank of something more permanent than fish or weed. Uh, there is definitely sort of like some sexual innuendo happening here. We're personifying the wreck, we're beginning to, but I came to explore the wreck, period. Right, before, and it is easy to forget what I came here for. Right, oh my God, it's like beautiful. Like, oh my gosh, I love it so much. And then, I came to explore the wreck. The words are purposes. The words are maps. I was led here, I was guided here by language. But now I have to see it for myself. I have to witness it for myself. Again, the difference between learning and experience that, that our preparedness, it brought us to this point, but that it can't, it can't cement us in this point. We have to do that ourselves. We have to witness the wreck. I came to see the damage that was done. I came to look at what we sacrificed and see the treasures that prevail. I came to justify the act through the treasures that that exist. I stroke the beam of my lamp slowly along the flank of something more permanent than fish or weed. <sighs> it's the thing itself. All right, I'm back. Uh, sorry, it's been a really hectic day, but I had to make sure I get this lecture finished for you. So um, we come back and it's evening now and this is the place. And I'm here, the mermaid whose dark hair streams black, the merman in his armored body. We circle silently about the wreck. We dive into the hold. I am she, I am he. We see reference to the armored body of the merman. So we were becoming one and yet two. So for me, I can read this and it's definitely when the poem sort of gets, it's, it's most bizarre and unfamiliar. Um, but here, now that we're facing the wreck together, um, Maybe I am becoming two, but also one in the same. I'm becoming comfortable with all facets of my identity because 
no one person is wholly feminine and no one person is wholly masculine, right? I am both the merman and his armored body whose hair streams black. I mean, sorry, the mermaid and their armored body whose hair streams black. Black too, remember? Uh, maybe in this poem, black is mysterious. That's also uncharted and unfamiliar again. Um, so my identity is not as sort of coded as it, it may have been. And now it's becoming, <laughs> it's becoming new. It's becoming um, my own. Um, and it's becoming um, undetermined. Uh, it's also feminine. And then we end with the merman in his armored body. So there's there's the, the, the atmosphere of strength. There's the perception of um masculinity and femininity in one encompassing one two it could be that i'm looking at the wreck and the wreck is composed of us and so i'm looking at the wreckage and who is in the wreck and i'm acknowledging the people that are in the wreck so maybe there is the essence of two people seeing the scars that the past has created we circle silently about the wreck we dive into the hold. So we dive into the embrace, into the acceptance, into the, into the togetherness, and we also dive into to the hold. We dive into each other. Um, and then hold too sort of sounds like the hull of a ship. We dive into the center of the wreckage. We too, I am she, I am he, I am equal. Uh, the sexes here are equal. Or I am the two as one. I am the balanced identity um, that's been sort of liberated by acknowledging the, the, the past and the, what the past has done. Whose drowned face sleeps with open eyes. Whose bare still bear the stress whose silver, copper, vermeil cargo lies. And we come back to sort of that image that we saw earlier with the, um, with the drowned face always staring towards the sun. So there's that sort of anxiety that was in there, whose drowned face sleeps with open eyes, whose breasts still bear the stress, whose silver, copper, vermeil cargo lies. Obscurely inside barrels, half wedged and left to rot. We are the half-destroyed instruments that once held to a course, a water-eaten log, a fouled compass. Um, and so here, vermeil means gold-plated. So I came to see the wreckage. I came to see the damage that had been done, the, what had been committed, the atrocities. I came to look at the thing myself, and I'm finding that it was worthless. Right, because we always want to justify the wreck. We want to, we want to sort of um, justify what it is that we create or the problems that we cause. So the water-eaten log. We are the half-destroyed instruments that once held to a course. We believed that we know that we knew the truth of things. We had only been equipped with the book of myths, so we were reading lies and we were sculpting our identity and our transition based off of lies that once held to a course. Now we're directionless, we're rudderless. Because now we're questioning, now we're observing for the first time, independent of what we once knew, the water-eaten log. Um, and so now we're, we're no longer uh, as sure as we once were and really that's what happens when we look into the wreck that's what happens when we when we stare into reality is we become sort of untethered by the path that we once were on and now we're just we're we're beginning to become aware and in that awareness we see the limitlessness in our direction we see the potential that lays before us we see how unmarred by tradition we become we are the half-destroyed instruments that once held to a course 
the water eaten log. And a log is all the, the places that the ship has traveled, right? It's the record of their travels and their roots. So it's fouled, it's broken. It's an object that can't fulfill its purpose. And so because it can't fulfill its purpose, it can never become the fouled compass. The fouled compass. We are, I am, you are, by cowardice or courage, the ones that find our way back to this scene, carrying a knife, a camera, a book of myths, in which our names do not appear. And so I, I actually really love that now we're kind of concluding this lecture in darkness, right? Um, because again, no matter who you are, you'll you'll eventually become, you'll find your way back to this moment. We are, we reader and me speaker. I am, you are, by cowardice or courage, the ones who find our way back to this scene, carrying a knife, a camera, a book of myths, in which our names do not appear. <laughs> um, and so as you can see, the only light that I have now um, is that from the laptop. And so I'm not going to cover irony. However, irony is a part of the PowerPoint that's been uploaded for you. So please feel free to, uh, and you should vi revisit irony so we can look at how elements of irony affect poetry. Um, and just have a wonderful week. Be sure to email me if you need anything and then look. Take this time of social distancing. Take this time of social distancing and get outside and enjoy the sunset. Bye.